Hi, Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Welcome to this episode. My guest today, Sherry Francis, has a story that is so absolutely compelling. Normally, I don't introduce books until the end here, but I've got to tell you, a secure at last, overcoming life's trage er, tragedies. Uh, I read this book and it just mesmerized me. Uh, there's so many things to unpack through this. Now, Sherry had uh, experiences in ministry all over the world, spe specifically in, uh, in parts of the U.S. and Hawaii and the Pacific. But she also died from a case of E. coli while she was in Manila. And during that experience, she had something that was very, very unique. And that is she saw... After she had died and entered into the presence of God, she saw the, the words, the word of God coming forth. We're going to get to that point, but we have quite a bit. Sherry, I want to welcome you to our program. It's great to have you. Thank you, Randy. It's so good to be here. Well, Sherry, we, you have a story that is unparalleled. Um, you were, I guess, the proverbial pastor's kid. But not only that, but your father was involved in some cutting edge ministries, Teen Challenge with Wilkerson, uh, and all of the things that were happening at that time. Uh, you were a child growing up in the faith, and uh, then you moved to Hawaii. So tell us a little bit about your childhood because it's so fascinating. Yeah, so um, my father was with Dave when Dave started the Teen Challenge back in New York, and then my brother, um, was a baby, he was born at that time, 1962, and had some very bad trauma at birth, so he had hydrocephalus. And um, because of that, he had a lot of surgeries, and, and so Dave said, hey, go back to, told my dad, go back to LA, Los Angeles, and start the Dean Challenge there. So we were, we opened the doors in 62, and uh, my brothers and I lived there for quite a period of time. Uh, and witnessed countless miracles. Um, I do remember actually crawling up the stairs to the boys' dorm, actually sneaking in because I wasn't supposed to be on that side of the, the center, walking and, and sneaking up and seeing a boy just heaving and going through raging with, with fever and withdrawals. And I thought, I am never going to touch drugs in my life, which hmm. <laughs> that was something I never went into. But um, so we, that was my very beginning um, was in Tea Challenge. And then when I was 10, we actually moved to Hawaii and started a Teen Challenge Center there. And people think, you know, well, you know, Lord, I'll go wherever you want, especially if it's Hawaii, you know. And we went there because there was a drug situation. Um, and, you know, who would have ever known? I came from a private school in Southern California to a public school in Hawaii that I would be, uh, there'd be racism against me. And of course, as a child, I was 10 years old, you don't really understand racism. And so, I mean, I was literally put in trash cans. I was beat up. Mm -hmm. I was a little scrawny, howly girl. And they would pin me up against the, I remember one time against the, um, the chalkboard and more than anything, I think what hurt me the most was no one talked to me. No one wanted to be my friend. No one cared about me. I was blamed for everything. And I was a really sensitive little girl. I mean, even as a little girl, I would cry easily, laugh easily. I could sense spirits, supernatural things in rooms. And so this just really, it, broke my heart into pieces, to be honest. I was I was literally walking home from school day after day and tears. Just, mm. why doesn't anybody like me? And, you know, not that I thought I was anything great, but why does everyone hate me? You know, and 
believe it or not, those little buttons that start when we're little, you, you know this, Randy, that those things that, that hurt us form these lies about who we think we are and our, our um, perception of who I am is a lot of times started way back. And there's sometimes by these little, we would say silly things, but literally I grew up thinking that I wasn't like anybody else. Something was wrong with me. You know, I, I wasn't, um, I couldn't figure out what it was, but I just knew I wasn't like everybody else and I was different and no one liked me. So something must be wrong with me. Um, and that sort of carried over as a button later on, even in my life, which God healed and I'll, I'll share about that in a little bit yeah that that's horrendous oftentimes we think of kind of racism as parochial to where we live in our nation what have you but racism is an endemic to sin it's seeing yeah. people by based on the characteristics that are not what God sees exactly it's what people see in the superficial and you were at the uh, effect of that in Hawaii beautiful place and I think it is ironic then that in your ministry travels mm -hmm. that you are going into the Pacific where you are never, well, rarely you are not, are not always in the, in those islands and what have you, that you are never in the majority. Right. Uh, and so you're constantly at the effect of being different and, and all of these things going on. But at the same time, you are being raised in the faith yeah. and uh, seeking after the Lord. Now you had uh, a number of supernatural, supernatural experiences during yeah. your, during your youth. Yeah, I did. Um, and I, you know what? I, I kind of look back at, I don't know how many people have seen the Jesus revolution, but that was sort of what our church was like. We were Kailua church, a block from the beach. Um, I played the piano way back then, um, and we would literally take our piano, put it on a truck it, on Sunday nights, take it down to Kailua Beach Pavilion, set up, and people would come to Christ, and, you know, we would sing songs and dance around the piano and worship Jesus, and um, so even though I had this sort of soreness in my heart, on the other side, Jesus was my comfort. Jesus was everything I lived for. And um, during that time, I, I literally set a, a time at night. It was nine o'clock in the evening. And even as a young teenager, I would tell people, don't call me. Don't, um, I won't do anything. I need to be home by nine o'clock because nine o'clock is when I have time with Jesus. And I would journal. Journaling was huge to me, um, helping me work through, you know, your teenage hormones and those kind of things that happen. And so journaling, praying, um, listening to Jesus um, was a big part of my life. And um, even though I, I have to go back and say that the church I was in that was having revival was also somewhat legalistic. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> they sort of um, pr proposed that if you were to sin and Jesus was to come back or you were to die, then you would go to hell. So I was always um, on my tiptoes. I kind of viewed Jesus as the docile, gentle, loving, caring, and God as the one that would judge me and would be, I was a little afraid of, to be honest. Hmm. Um, one night, I, I actually remember it was when I was playing the piano at church on a Sunday night, and we would go until midnight, Randy literally back in the day we i would go to school the next morning but it was one of those nights and people were praying around the altar so i was still playing the piano and i went into the back room when everybody left and i started repenting and because i was so used to carrying shame right for my sins and also just didn't want to hurt jesus um i was again repenting but having a hard time believing that jesus would forgive me and I had this vision that was just incredible. Um, and a vision to me was, and I've had a few of them um, throughout, actually a lot of them throughout my life, but um, it's kind of where it's not weird or anything. It's just where all of a sudden you're not really in the room, you're sensing you're in a different place and you see something that's not in front of you, but it's real and something you wouldn't make up. 
and I was praying and all of a sudden I saw this white, beautiful, beautiful white sparkling bridal gown and it came from heaven. And as I was praying, I could see my body and that bridal gown just settled and came right down and just covered my whole body. Mm -hmm. And I looked to, to the Lord and he said, Sherry, as soon as you ask me forgiveness, this is what I see. I see Jesus. Jesus is, is your, your covering. You're beautiful to me. You are spotless to me. And, and that was one of the first times I felt like I understood a little bit of what God's mercy and forgiveness and true, truly what love was. Um, fast forward. Um, I had an experience uh, in my room, actually had several experiences and I don't know if there's times maybe where Satan is um, looking at an opportunity to snatch you from Jesus. And this may be that opportunity in my life was that summer of being 16. But I had many um, experiences where and I, I can't say I saw a literal figure. I saw a shadow, a black shadow. They were black shadows. I could hear them though, they were loud. I could hear them uh, saying, and for some reason they said over and over again, aha, Sherry, aha. And then they would kind of come towards my bed. And for some reason, I always knew they were gonna come up. It felt like they were gonna come up to my neck. And you know, being almost paralyzed with fear, finally I would scream out, Jesus. And they'd just be gone. There wasn't a, there wasn't, a, a fat, uh, slow leaving. It was a, they were gone. Um, so those, that was happening. And then at the same time, Jesus started visiting me and I heard God's voice once and he called my name and he said, I've called you to be in ministry for me. Mm -hmm. uh, my girlfriend was actually spending the night that night. And um, she said, you kept saying, Lori, did you just say something? I woke her up apparently. And um, I actually, before I finished writing the book, I actually called Lori because I, I didn't want anything to be inaccurate. You know, it, that was a long time ago. I'm 63. That was, I was 16. But um, she said, no, you, you woke me up and you said, somebody's calling my name and it's God. And so she, she said, I, you know, you told me that story. But one night particularly was, it changed my life. Um, on this earth, the closest I ever knew of unconditional love was my mom. And I knew that she supported me no matter what. There was never a question about that. Um, but I had never experienced anything beyond that kind of love. This night, I woke up. And Jesus, I mean, I can see the whole thing in my mind. He walked in my door in Hawaii, in my room, and he sat down at the end of my bed. And he put his arm around me. We sat there for hours. Um, he didn't speak like words, like um, there weren't words. It was like he would just, I would just know what he was saying. And it was perfectly understood. No misunderstanding. And then he would know what I said. And it was such a pure form of communication. Um, but every time I even think about this, I think people don't know. They don't know the love that God has for them. The love that Jesus has for them is so unconditional. And so not like anything on this earth. Like I felt every pore, every cell, every single part to the inside of me was cherished. Mm -hmm. It was loved. It was held. It was close. It was, I'm his forever. Doesn't matter what I do. He loves me. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make you want to do anything that hurts him. It does the opposite. Makes you just want to please him. So important, Sherry, because oftentimes we feel that God is angry at us and the reason we don't want to sin is because we don't want to be at the effect of that anger. Yeah. When the motivation should be, why would we want to hurt 
the one who loves us so very much. Absolutely. And that's a much more greater motivating factor to do good, to overcome yes. these other inclinations that we may have. Absolutely. It, you know, I think about it even I probably the closest um, relationship you have is your husband and wife relationship. And I think about my husband, if I was afraid of him, that would I might do things that, you know, to keep out of trouble, but I wouldn't look for ways to please him. You know, it's a mm -hmm. difference. Like I looked for ways for, to make Jesus smile, to make mm -hmm. God happy, his heart happy, because that's how he made me feel. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, Randy, because for a while, it was several months. I literally walked around without ever... Um, as a teenager, you know how we try to please people and we don't know who we are. We're trying to put our best foot forward. I didn't care what people thought because I was so secure. I just knew how loved I was mm. and it, it didn't, I didn't have to please anybody. Um, that was a great experience. It was a great feeling. So you would think after that experience, I would never, ever, ever walk away from him. And, and, and to this day, I still look back and go, you know, we're human. And we still have a debase, you know, we have our sinful nature that's there. Um, and it's what we feed ourselves. Do we feed ourselves more the debased nature or do we feed ourselves more in the desires of Christ? Hmm. And so during that time, I, my best friend at school was a guy and um, we were just very, very close friends. And uh it started turning into more of a dating relationship, but he wasn't a Christian, but he was a good guy. He just wasn't a Christian. So I'm thinking, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to evangelize him. I'm going to bring him to Jesus. And I've heard that so much. And my heart just goes, young people don't do it. Don't do it because more times than not, you become little by little more like them and not the other way around. Mm. And so Satan does it give us this okay now you're going to serve me from this place over here to this place over here it's these little tiny subtle uh choices that we make which is what happened with me i started making little tiny choices um uh, well i don't need to go wednesday night to church you know i go on sundays you know and it was just these slow little subtle changes in me i didn't have as much time now for my quiet time those are times i spent with him and um, in looking back, um, I, I, I broke Jesus' heart. I know I did because I started going that direction of the world. And um, that lasted not long, lasted about a year, year to a year and a half. Um, af at the end of this time, year and a half after this time, I was literally, um, I tell you about an experience that I was at a party and um, I, you know, in joking and jest, um, the host wrapped me up in this blanket. And I thought at this time that he, he made it into a, a joke and people were laughing. And then he put me over his, his shoulder like a knapsack. And then he went down the hallway and he took me to his room and threw me on the bed and um, jumped on top of me. And at this point, you know, of course, I'm screaming, I'm kicking, but he was very strong. And, um, and so he had his way with me. Um, I was not active in that way. So for me, this was huge. It was just humiliating and shameful. And uh, you can only know if you experience it's a, it's a horrible place to be. Mm. Um, and I remember sneaking out and trying to get to my car without anybody seeing me. And I went to my, I had a VW bug and I got in my car and I closed the door and I just gripped the steering wheel and sobbed um, because something life-changing I knew had happened to me. Something had been taken from me. Hmm. And so I went home and I thought, you know, Sherry, if you don't tell anybody, it'll be like it never happened. You know, just, you, you don't have to deal with this. This is too much for you. Just don't tell anyone. I got in the shower, got washed, felt like I was getting, just clean it off and get it, you know, get it out of your head. Don't tell anybody. And that's how I handled it. 
um, not good. I thought I could just, the, sh the feeling would go away. The anger, the feeling, the shame, the humility, hu uh, the, not the humility, the shame. So I, about um, six weeks later, I was at my work and I knew that I hadn't been feeling good. Um, and a girlfriend said, you know, you need to go get tested. And I said, for what? She goes, you need to get tested because you're acting like you're pregnant. And I said, oh no, I, I couldn't be pregnant because I'm not active. And you know, in my mind, I had so compartmentalized that Randy, so mm -hmm. weird how we can do that. Yeah. Like I just put it over here in a compartment and the more she told me, then it, it dawned on me, you know, it could. So I went, I remember going to the doctor and I, I literally remember him coming in with his white uh, jacket on and he had been my family doctor for a long time. And he told me, you know, that it, the test was positive. He said, you need to know that it's so small, I can't see it. And he never said the baby, he never said, he just said it you um, are too young to handle this. And it's very easy to get rid of it. It's, it's not even a, it's not a human being yet. It's just a clump of cells. Mm -hmm. And I can't even see it without a microscope, which we know today is not true, but um, so I scheduled the appointment. And the reason being in my heart, of course I wasn't serving the Lord at the time, but also I hated this what was inside of me. I know that sounds horrible, but I was just so disgusted with, with it that I'm carrying this when that person perpetrated it and it's inside of me. And all I wanted was again, it to be gone. And I thought if I did this, that it would be gone and I wouldn't have to face it anymore. I could just, again, like, like putting the rape under the, under the carpet, I could do the same thing. And, and so I did, um, I'm very, not very um, proud of that and very, very, and very much, but I know people, I know there's some of you out there listening that you understand. And I hate the fact that you um, feel like there's no, there's no answer because God has an answer for you. The answer for me would have been for me to adopt the child out. And of course today I would have done that, but even if you do or have had an abortion and many of us in this world have that no one knows about, but I know because when I speak, I have ladies come up to me. I just, it just happened. I was speaking and this lady came up to me and she leaned over her daughter was behind her. She was probably 75. And she said, no one knows. No one. My husband, my, my children, nobody knows. The same thing happened to me. And I, I thought, oh, I said to her, oh, if you have, if this has happened, you need to have, um, you need to experience God's healing. You can't, you can't just put that under the rug. There's something still there. There will be, there will be, but God can heal and take that completely away. The sting of it, the shame of it. Um, so I thought, Randy, after this happened, I would be free, you know, free. I had the abortion and it was nothing but the opposite. Now I felt shame and horrible and hated myself. And it just perpetuated for a year, literally, till I got to the point where I actually went to a movie. I saw a movie where there were um, children that had been aborted. They were in a pit. And they had their hands raised and they were screaming at their moms and their moms were looking over the pit and they were saying, why did you do this to us? Well, that's a lie. We know that mm -hmm. we know that. Yes. But at the time it just ripped my heart to a million pieces. I'm so sorry. Um, and so um, I went home and I didn't come out of my room for a few days. I just, sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. And the only person I told was my brother, but I just wanted to die. And I was trying to understand um, what will happen to me if I die, because I knew there's a heaven and hell. And I was at that, there's a critical point where I didn't know 
there was no winning, right? If I lived, I was going to be like horribly, a horrible, shameful life and hate myself. And if I die, I wouldn't be in heaven with Jesus, I thought at that time. And at that point, my father walked in and he picked me up and he said, let's sit on the bed and let's, let me just hold you. And I just sobbed in his shoulder. And he said, Sherry, you know, I'm your earthly father. You know, I love you, but I don't love you near as much as our heavenly father loves you. And it doesn't matter what you've done. I will forgive you because who you are is the person I love, not your experiences, not your failures. I love you. And I, for the first time, had a window of hope, like a little light in that mm. tunnel was there. And I said to Jesus, Lord, I will serve you for the rest of my life, even if you never, ever give me feelings again. If I never feel joy, if I never feel peace, I just know that I want you to be pleased with me. And I give you my life again. And, you know, you would have thought that I would have lots of, I'm just being really transparent here, you know, really honest. I'm not trying to doctor anything up because sometimes, you know, it's the response we get is not the response we thought. And at that point, I thought he's going to give me, you know, that joy again. But you know what, Randy, it didn't happen. I didn't have any feelings. And I had to go by my choice for a while. Lord, I choose you no matter what I feel. Father, no matter if I feel unforgivable, you said you would forgive me. I just quoted scriptures. Mm. And my family said, you need to, you need to leave this area. You need to go somewhere and um, be in a different environment. So I went to a, or, an organization called Youth with a Mission, which is um, also in Hawaii. Um, it's all over the world, but there was a base in Kona. So I went there uh, and I was assigned a counselor who everyone is assigned a counselor. It's the, the school that I, I joined was called the Discipleship Training School, the DTS. It's a six month course. The first three months are just a rotor rooter of God's healing depth, depth to the core of who you are. And the last three months out of that, you minister and you give out. And so Gail was my counselor. And I remember her, she had an Australian accent and I loved to listen to her talk. And she would tell me anytime you want to come to my room, anytime, day or night, come, I'm here for you. And it was always at night. I would be plagued with nightmares and they were always of men and of things happening to me. And, and so I would go there often to her room. And one night she said, Sherry, we need to go through the steps of healing. You need, you need to be delivered from this. And it's nothing I can do with just my words or my counsel or my wisdom. These are some things you need to do. So I'm just going to share some of that with you and our listeners, because I know, you know, people, we are all hurt in some way or another in our life. Life's not perfect. And you may not have had this exact experience, but you've had your tragedies and you've had your misunderstandings where people judged you wrong. You've had hurts. You've maybe hurt other people. Um, you, you're grappling with something maybe different, but the healing is the same. Jesus wants to heal you. Mm -hmm. And um, so I just want to go through what, what um, steps I went through with Gail. Um, she basically said, first of all, we have to go through this event and you have to, you'd have to go through this event as it went, telling me what's going on and holding Jesus in your, with your hand. You're not alone. And I'd always experienced this in my thoughts alone. And so this was kind of different. Like I didn't see Jesus that he was with me during that time. I felt abandoned. And so it was, that was new for me. And so I had to um, walk through the, the whole experience and then speak to um, and, and see Jesus's hand with me and um, speak out 
Lord Jesus, you're with me. I am not alone speaking the truth. This is what I'm going through, but you're here with me. I'm not alone. And the, the Bible says that he will never, ever leave us. He will never, ever, ever, in whatever circumstance you're in, he doesn't leave us. He doesn't mm -hmm. forsake us. He is always with you. Um, also, I had to renounce the lies that I had believed after the rape and then after the abortion. And the lies for me were, you know, you just can't please God. There's something wrong with you. Again, that button from my childhood, you know, there's something wrong with you. You just can't please God. You weren't, you're made differently than other people. Um, you just have a propensity for this. Um, I just believed that I was, I, that I wasn't, I couldn't be holy. I guess that's the word. I just couldn't please him. And um, so I had to replace that lie because that's not true. Jesus paid that price for me. And yes, I can't be perfect. That is true. But I am forgiven. I am whole. I am beautiful in his sight. And that was another lie that I had to replace with the truth. Mm. The hardest part for me was the forgiveness part. Um, because to me, forgiveness was saying, you're right. You, you're okay. What you did was okay. All right. It's, it's not so bad. It was okay. You know, forgiveness is, we think, we think that makes the other person, it takes them off the hook, but it actually, they're not being punished whatsoever. It's you that's being punished, you and me. And so while I was, when she said to forgive him, I said, I, I can't, I hate him. I don't want to, but I hate what he did to me. And she said, okay, I want you to do this. I want you to say the words. Do you want to forgive him? I said, yes. She said, I want you to say the words. I forgive you his name as if you never did this to me. I don't hold you accountable anymore. I let you, I let this go. And I said, well, okay, I can say that. And she said, you're not going to feel it. It's okay. You won't feel it for a while. And she said, you just, every time you have a thought about him or that event, you have to go back to, I have forgiven. I made a choice. And you know what? It's even better if you could do it with somebody. Like with me, it was Gail. And she could remind me, no, you already, you forgave him on this date. This was a choice you made. It's a covenant you made. And so not that I ever felt that way. I'm going to just, again, be honest with you. I still felt wronged and hated and I mean, hatred towards him. But um, she said, I want you to start praying for him. And I want you to see him as Jesus sees him. I want you to see his soul. And so uh, I started praying a lot, a lot. And every time that situation came about where I could talk about it, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't speak about it to people. Um, I, it was privately between me and God at that, at that time. Since I've been healed, I've talked about it. But during that time, I didn't speak badly about him because I was praying for him like Jesus would. I was interceding for his life. And, you know, at the beginning, that didn't change my feelings. But I have to say, I remember distinctly when I started praying and went, I actually feel sorry for him. And that was the first, hmm. the first feeling. And then a little bit later, it was, God, have mercy on him. He, he doesn't, like Jesus said on the cross, he doesn't know. He doesn't know the pain he caused you. Um. And then I would say it was a good maybe six months where I, 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 I looked at the situation and went, you know what? I have no pain anymore. My pain is gone. Hmm. I am. I can talk about it without crying, without feeling like I'm the victim. I don't have that. It's like I speak about it because I do counsel other women. But when I do, it's like I'm talking third party. It's not me. Because hmm. that person was, I have, I've forgiven him. I'm set free from him and he doesn't control my emotions anymore. And that is the best place to be when you've been mm -hmm. wrong that severely. Yes, absolutely. You know, that, that goes for anyone. And I love that you, uh, Sherry, bring up the fact that uh, forgiveness of someone else is not an absolution for them. It's an absol It absolves our need to be, captive to that 
to what happened to us, the offense. Yeah. It's not saying it's okay to the other person. In fact, the Bible talks about that. When you forgive somebody, it actually heaps coals on their head. That's, that's, that means that the coals, the burning, the pain in us is now relieved. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened uh, to you. And you were at this, so you were healed at that point. And um, you would think that, and this is another conundrum uh, for anyone, and that is that you had been going through so much that that you deserved a life that would be free of much of the pain that you had endured uh, to this point. But that wasn't the case. Um, difficult childhood, taunted um, by other children, no friends. Then this um, attack had happened to you, this severe, horrific attack. And then this kind of continued to a, to a nice person. I mean, you... You, you are an accomplished person. You started three music schools, became an accomplished uh, music artist, uh, singing with, um, you know, some very popular groups uh, as a vocalist. But you were on that destiny, but the, the other destiny that was about to happen was tragic as well. Yeah, yeah. So, fa yeah, fast forward. And I do want to say, like, I just thought I, I said that I didn't have any feelings after coming back to Christ. Oh, he restored that. He restored all of that. And um, there was nothing as sweet. And there is nothing as sweet as my time with Jesus and with the Lord. So fast forward. I married um, a gospel singer um, who... Uh, and a minister and so we traveled like you said Randy we traveled for two years um and did um sang around the world did um actually on our honeymoon we did um 60 days in a row in Europe of services mm. and I think even God was tired of church at the end of that time <laughs> <laughs> that's a lot of church it is. Uh, yeah so uh we were missionaries in Singapore um, and then we were also pastors of two churches in, uh, the Bay in, I'm sorry, in Sacramento area. And then God called us to go to Fiji as assembly of God missionaries. And, um, during that time, uh, we had actually, we'd been there for six years and we were like, Lord, we're just sensing that you're moving us somewhere else, but we're not sure where. And. Um, the Assemblies of God said, we need a church in Manila and an English speaking church. Would you start a church there? And so we went over uh, to that church, to the national church, actually. And uh, in between, we had, you know, they had approved us. We had found a house um, We had the kids enrolled in Faith Academy. So we were pretty much dialed in to go there. And a girlfriend of mine who um, is still a missionary um, and she and I grew up together. She's a missionary in Manila. She uh, said, let's go out and, you know, get some food. And, you know, you know, Randy, when you travel, I mean, there's all kinds of bacteria and Giardia and all kinds mm -hmm. of things. Well, I hadn't really had a bad time with that in Fiji. So I thought I'm strong. So she said, can you eat it at a hawker stall, which is an outdoor um, stall? Um, and I said, yeah, I can do that. So we ate and not thinking much about it. Um, carried on with the day. And a few hours later, I started getting very, very sick. And we were actually looking, I believe we were looking at a house and I went outside cause I was dizzy and I was my fever. I started having a fever and my stomach was upset. And um, I thought, well, maybe it's the food I ate but not giving it too much thought. Well, by the end of that day, that night, I was severely, violently throwing up and, you know, just getting rid of all, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And we were staying at a missions house. And, uh, so I, if you've ever been to Manila, it's not easy to get to a hospital. Traffic is not easy to get through. So they just said, why don't you just, you know, stay low. And well, that turned into three days, but those three days I was, it got really bad to where I was bleeding 
um, out of a lot of orifices. And um, then my body one night, um, I believe it, well, I, I know it was in shock because my fever was spiked so high and I was, I started sweating, the sheets were wet. Uh, my husband got on the ground to sleep because it was, I was shaking a lot. And then I, I knew my body wasn't good when it started, you know, <laughs> going up and down off the, off of the bed a lot. And then pretty soon, boom, something from inside me came out and it wasn't scary or anything. It was just strange. And I'm floating and I floated to the ceiling. Um, and I didn't have any, I didn't have any fear. It was just strange to see myself laying there. Hmm. I could see myself. I could see my husband on the floor and I knew that, um, maybe this is, maybe I'm going to heaven. I've, I've heard about this. My Nana had an experience. Actually, she died uh, when she was in her thirties of breast cancer and was clinically dead for, I think she was dead for seven minutes, but her experience was one that you've, many people on your show have talked about that um, she went to a garden, Jesus was there, she, the flowers, I'm kind of backpedaling, sorry, but this is just all, I had heard this as a little girl growing up, the, gar the garden was full of, she said, colors and sounds that she had never heard before, music, that was involved with nature. Nature and music were wrapped up together and light. All of that was wrapped up, translucent light mm -hmm. that were pouring praises to God. And she said she wanted to go across this river because she saw Jesus and Jesus said, um, you can come. And if you do, you will not be able to go back. But also at the same time, the Lord let her hear her daughter crying. That was my grandma. And my grandma was a Halian and she was 14. And she said, God, you know, I need her. You know, I need her. Bring me back, bring her back. And so my Nana did choose to go back. And I'm telling you, she lived until she was 78, mm -hmm. but she literally longed for heaven. Yes. It was, she was not satisfied ever again on this earth. And all she wanted to do was talk about heaven. Mm -hmm. But I just have to say this as a side note. She would say to me when I was a little girl, Sherry, there are things, and she had no teeth. There are things I just can't tell you because Lisa said, they're only for heaven. And I remember thinking, I, I know, Grandma, I get it, but I won't tell anybody. I promise I will never <laughs> tell a soul. She, you know, baby. I so you'd have to see it for yourself then. I got to, yeah. <laughs> and so, okay, this is the part of the story that gets a little crazy. Um, that I'd never heard anybody else talk about. Um, and it was when I was a little girl, I was in a uh, Christian Girl Scouts kind of a club. It's called Missionettes. And we, we were very steeped in the word. We read the Bible several times. We uh, memorized large portions of scripture. And so by now I'm an adult. I don't think I could have quoted all these scriptures to you, but they were literally coming. I was, so I'm at the ceiling looking down at my body and there are beams of light encased in each of the beams is a word. And then the words are coming fast. And they were, the words were scriptures that I had memorized when I was a, a child. And again, I couldn't, I could have quote those to you, but, but they were just, Jesus was ministering light and the word mm. himself to me bringing me back. And that's what brought me back several times. I would go back, shoot, I'm back in my body. I'm not happy that I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. No, I know. <laughs> the fever, the chill, the whole thing. And, and so then I would again um, go and same thing would happen. So I, Brandy, I just liken that to, you know, the word of God, the word became flesh the light of the world. If you look at John, that's where, where Jesus is the light. He is the word. And those two things are what saved me. Yes. They brought me back to life. You know, I, I love that. And it is, is unique to your story, Sherry, because you were steeped in the word uh, f uh, as a child, you know, in your family with your father. And, and then that continued on and you're, training and YWAM and T 
Teen Challenge and all that. So you were constantly at the effect of hearing and reading the Word of God. But then it became real to you as the presence of the Almighty, that it wasn't just um, typed letters or words on a piece of paper. It became inculcated into you through the the spoken word of God manifested as the very real presence of God. That's a that's a dynamic that is almost impossible to understand because we don't have any words in the all of the world's lexicons to explain what that is. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I just think about the word was spoken and creation happened. You know, the word is powerful and there's a lot of teachings on that but it was the word that healed me and that brought me back. And it's so funny because um, I, at that point was so mad at Satan, you know, trying to snuff me out, take me away from this ministry. And if he's fighting that hard, I I just decided I'm going to go. And so we just, before we decided, you know, that we were moving the kids, I said, let's text or not text. There was no cell phones. Let's uh, call. 10 people we respect in the ministry. Some of them were actually in the missions board and, and just tell them what happened and just make sure that, you know, that we have their covering and their approval. And so we did that with 10 different people. They all a hundred percent said, don't go come back. You're going to bury Sherry there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just my experience, whether that was right or wrong. We came back. Um, And so, and this is another hard fact is that there was troubles in our marriage. And um, again, I must be, I'm listening to myself because of the way I handle situations, I tend to bury and and try not to let anybody know. Um, and there, I'm sure there's people out there, listeners that are like me. I encourage you not to do that about your marriage because I did that and, um, and that didn't work. Um, you have to speak, you have to communicate, you have to have, um, there needs to be a two-way street. So sadly, in um, that marriage, uh, my my husband and I were divorced. Um, the, we have become where well, we've maintained a friendship, and we still even, fa- in fact, have holidays together with our kids and grandkids. So, um, but then I was single for eight years, uh, and I hats off to single moms who have kids and they take care of them and bring, you know, bring them to church and do make a living and all the things we have to do. Um, so eight years later, I met and married, um, a man I'm going to call Kevin, um, just to protect his identity. Um, he, uh, was a great big man. He was a gentle giant, very kind hearted, would do anything for you. He, Basically, my family was very skeptical and protective of me at this point, were very taken by him and just loved him. Um, And I thought, I have, you know, God is blessing me and this is, you know, a new chapter. Um, So this marriage went on for five years and I started getting um, these uh, statements from credit cards in the mail. And they were my credit cards that had been run up to the limit. And, um, I was, so I would call and talk to him and cause we really had more of a weekend relationship. He was in San Francisco working for the week and then we were together on the weekends. So I remember calling and asking him what, what that was. Well, I didn't mention this, but the first date I had with him, he told me he had spinal cordoma cancer. Mm-hmm. And that they had to radiate three, um, radiate his neck um, every three months, and that it was treatable, and he could maintain a normal, healthy life if he did this. So um, every three months he would go to get this treatment. Well, when these credit cards came, he said, when I did question him about it, he said, "Oh, I'm so sorry. Those I did want to tell you and upset you, but those were my medical bills that I needed to pay." So. Um, other events started occurring. The police showed up at the door and, uh, arrested him while our family was all there having a barbecue. And, um, I guess he had committed insurance fraud and that just led to one more thing and one more thing until I thought, you know, I, 
I guess being raised in church, you can be kind of gullible, you know, because you've seen, you've been around people that are honest. So you just expect that is what's in your world. And so I really didn't question until now. At that point, I said, you know, you need to come clean with me. There's some things going on that are not, not good. And his response was, um, he didn't, he didn't actually want to come clean until I found out that he was not having um, radiation treatment. And that was because he had given me, um, actually, finally, he'd given me the name of the facility that he was having radiation. I checked it out, called every facility in the area. No one knew who he was. So when I mentioned that on the phone to him one night, he said, okay, I'm going to come clean. Uh, please uh, meet me at my parents' house. And so at that point, I hadn't mentioned, but he said he had tried to commit suicide three times in six months, those six months. Mm. And the police had tracked him. And he, of course, that had not happened. So this night, he said, meet me at my parents' house, and I, I will tell you the truth. I'm on my way up there, and I get a phone call. And he says, Sherry, I, I just can't. I just can't do it. I'm sorry. I just can't do it. And at that point, he said, please come get me before the animals do. Oh. And because I had had that, those prior times where I had the exact same thing happen, I said, you know, Kevin, I just need a really good night's sleep. I am so tired. And I don't, this is, this is something that you just need to deal with. I, I said to him, I don't want to get divorced. I want to work this out. Whatever you've done, I will forgive you. We'll go to counseling. I just want you to tell me the truth. You can't, you can't have a marriage without truth. Mm -hmm. And so um, he started texting and texting and I turned my phone off when I went to sleep. The next morning I was woken up by a phone call at five o'clock and um, it was a police and he had hung himself. Mm. Well, there's no words to describe how I felt that how shocked, betrayed, confused, grief. It was just a ball of wax. And so it was kind of like walking in that maze you, you do when you have bad information and grief sets in. And um, so I had questions. Did he ever love me? Did was my life really just there to facilitate his habits? What are his habits? What is the truth? There were so many questions. And again, I just wanted to shut that out. So I went to bed. I literally went to bed and slept. If I woke up, I would drink wine if, or take sleeping pills. Whatever it would get me back to sleep to get away from that pain. I just couldn't face it. And I shut people out too for six months. I didn't talk to my family, my friends. I They would begged me to talk to them. And I just wanted to be left alone. Mm -hmm. You know what? At that point, I kind of woke up and went, you know, I can't bury my head in the sand. I've done that before. How does that work for you? It's mm -hmm. not working. I need, and I know Jesus heals, you know, I just don't, it's, it was so painful. I, I think maybe it was the most painful thing I'd ever gone through of all the things I'd gone through. And I think it was the betrayal um, and the grief. And so I went to Hawaii because that's my happy place of where God speaks to me on the beach and um, journaled, journaled, prayed, prayed. And Jesus said, there's healing for you. There are steps you need to take again. And these were a little bit different steps because it was a different situation. Um, and I just want to speak to you listeners because I don't want to just be, it's just not, a, I'm not saying this because it's about me. I am saying this because many, many, many of you walk around just like me. You're, uh, you're, you're frazzled. You're at the end of your rope. You, you don't think anybody will understand. You hate what is going on, but you don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. You know, or, and I'm just going to say this in love, you are the victim and you're using that victimhood for attention um, 
because it's become your identity, you know? And if I could say anything to you, do not, please do not think that that is where God wants to leave you. That isn't his best for you. God has so much more for you. And his t- intention for you when he created you was for you to live a life of joy, not always happiness, not always good things happening, but that relationship with him where he loves you and you walk in joy, you walk in victory. Your heart is a testimony of him. You can't help but speak of him to people. You see people coming to Christ. Your joy is that. That is a walk that no one can take away by circumstances. Nobody. And you can choose that. And it's a choice. The choice is, do I want to remain a victim? Do I, is it too much work for me to take the steps and to choose healing? Because it is. I'm not going to lie and say that there are people I know that were supernaturally healed of things right instantaneously right then. I saw that all the time in Teen Challenge. There are situations where that isn't instantaneous. There are steps we have to take. And like when I forgave the man that raped me, I had to make a choice. That was a choice. And that is going to be a little work. Sometimes that's a little work. I'm Mm -hmm. going to be honest. But you guys, I've been through so many things and not that mine is worse than yours, but I can tell you honestly, there is nothing, nothing that God can't heal and nothing that he can't bring good from and joy from. My joy is that he's using me right now. I've written a book. The book has been ministry to many people's broken hearts. And those bad things that have happened to you, God wants to take those things from you. He wants to use those things and turn them around to be in, in glorifying God, to be healing to other people, to show other people what healing looks like, what being set free looks like. And so in my experience at this time, I had to, I had to get up. I had to stop taking sleeping pills first, first off. I had to get my health back, my body back. I mean, if you've been through tremendous trauma, your hormones go crazy, your adrenaline goes crazy, it can change your physiological. So there's nothing wrong with medication if that's what you need. That's what really helped me. My adrenaline was spent. I couldn't talk to people without shaking. I shook like this. I couldn't breathe sometimes. God had to restore my, my body, my physical, my spirit, and my soul. And give me hope. Hmm. So with the physical, he did. He did. He gave me doctors that helped me to have the the um, supplements that I needed to heal my body. I started another thing that's really important, and it's so it's for our physical, but and we think may think, oh, that's not spiritual, but our physical affects us spiritually. And exercise is the way God made us. He hmm. made us to respond to our minds to be clearer, our stress to be less, Mm -hmm. getting out those, our endorphins to be stirred up. That was another part. I needed to forgive. And that was huge. Mm -hmm. And that took on a life of its own. And it took a while. Um, And I did the exact same steps I was telling you about. I, I sought out a person, seek out a person that, that you trust a person that don't just tell anybody, if you want to take this walk, Find a person that is really sensitive to God and his voice that loves you and tell them, I want you to walk with me on this journey. I don't, you know, sometimes people can do it alone. Sometimes they can't. Mm -hmm. And so take that person and say, I want you to walk me through this forgiveness. I want you to pray with me. I want you to hold me accountable um, is what I did. And God, again, he restored that my complete shattered heart because I wasn't angry at this person. I wasn't bereaved anymore at this person. I wasn't grieved. I said, God, I want you to take this and use this. I'm going to fast forward because I know I'm talking a lot. Um, And so um, get into a church, get into a small group because 
accountability is super important and people knowing who you really are, have a place that's safe for you to be true and real and honest. Um, these are all things that will benefit you. The body of Christ is important. You don't wanna be alone. I know so many people have told me, I can do this by myself. I don't need, I know God, you know, I have my Bible. You need people. You yes. really need Christians around you. And, um, and, and ones that are trustworthy. Mm -hmm. Choose wisely, choose wisely mm -hmm. who your friends are. Uh, and so I also had to turn my gaze away because my gaze kept being at this situation at the hundred thousand dollars that I owed because of the bills at, so I, I could go on into detail. The book will tell you more, but I had a lot of things I was facing. You know what? Instead of just looking at those things, if my gaze was up, these things started rolling and they started working out and I started finding answers. Um, I, I didn't allow myself anymore to go down into that pit and continue that spiral. Yes. So <clears throat> I want to say to you that, you know, at, after a few months, I found myself a great body of Christ, um, great Christian friends. And um, a few years later, you'd probably look at me and go, Sherry, you're crazy that you got married again. <laughs> what were you thinking? <laughs> but God brought a man into my life that was godly and is godly and is trustworthy and is real and um, has walked with me now the last eight years. Um, you would think, okay, so everything's going good, right? So two and a half years ago, I should have died in a car accident. And I will mention that briefly, Randy, I don't want to go too long, but um, I was somehow pole vaulted out through the sunroof that was closed and shot out of that and went 25 feet from the road. Mm -hmm. So when they came to get me, they came with a body bag and um, I was shattered in pieces. Mm -hmm. um, my whole bottom of my face was laid open. My gums were outside, just horrendous. The worst part of it though, was the pelvis. I was, it was crushed all over and I had no foundation. I couldn't move. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, they had me sit for three months, just not moving. Um, which for me was a bit difficult. My, you know, normally my head would spin off um because i'm just real active but you know what it was really interesting god was more close to me than he's ever been before i felt like i was just in this bubble and my friends would say aren't you like bored or sad or don't you miss going to places with us and i said no hmm. i am enjoying the best friendship i've ever ever had with with god and he speaks it's like we're back and forth all, all day long like i'm not alone I'm really not alone, guys. And one day I was saying to, to the Lord, you know, I'm here doing nothing. What am I here for? I had a 95% chance of dying. So 5%, you must want me here. That's how, you know, it's, it's, there's a reason. There's got to be a reason, God, you don't do this for, with just willy nilly. And so um, he said, okay, I want you to write a book. I said, oh, I come from a family of writers and I know how much time it takes to write a book. And I've always journaled. I love to write, but that takes thousands of hours. And I said, okay, well, you, you know, here's a fleece. If this happens, I'll do it. Well, that happened. Well, okay, let's do one more. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm glad that he gave you uh, those uh, responses to your fleeces that you put out. I know that and it seems silly, but I just wanted to know that I knew because I knew it was going to be a hard, hard road. So um, he did, he did. Um, answer those places. And so I started writing and the other thing, and, um, I'm not going to mention their names, but, um, I'm also very involved teaching, um, a very high official, um, and a very influential, um, official in government. So I mean, I'm there on Sundays every week, um, in their home with them. And, um, God has used uh, the, the wife, um, actually was used in one of my healings, my physical healings after this accident. 
long story short, she found, she knew that I was, something had happened to my heart and they weren't going to be able to do surgery. And I had a block left or aortia. And so they were going to have to do surgery. And yet I couldn't get in with COVID and all the things that were happening. I couldn't get in to see a doctor. And so she called, it's who you know, a uh, cardiologist. And I was in the next day. Um, they confirmed it. And so I had my Bible study ladies the next morning pray for me, lay hands on me and pray for me. And they had just come from a Mario Murillo um, healing service. And they said, we're going to pray that anointing on you. Well, I'm going to just be real honest. I just, you know, I've, I've been through a lot. I've been through a lot of surgeries in the last two years. So, you know, God sometimes heals, sometimes he doesn't. And so I really didn't get think too much about it. And that night while I was going to bed, something like electricity hit me and it like it hit my heart and I could hear it. It was pounding and I could hear the pounding when you're laying on your ear. I could hear it. And so, and I couldn't go to sleep. So I, I got up and I'm like, Lord, what is this? Next morning, tons of energy cleaning my house. Mm. Next day after day after day, I'm like, I need to go back. And so I called the cardiologist. I said, I need to come in. And he did another test. Healed, gone, nothing, nothing there. Mm. Nice so I was able to go back to her and say, guess what? God heals. He created our bodies. So uh, he heals more bodies. That was a, no doubt a profound um, ministry to, to that person. Yeah, it is. And it's still ongoing. I'd ask for your prayers. Um, because God is faithful and it's not up to us. You know, we're just obedient. We're just servants. Mm -hmm. We get to enjoy being his hands, you know, being yes. his mouthpiece. Um, but it's him that does the anointing. He does the healing. He does the, he brings that aha moment in our lives to see, yes. ooh, something we didn't see before. And I'm praying that. Yes. Um, so I just want to tell you people that are listening, um, your stories. We all have our story, right? You know, I'm not special. Uh, we're all different. And, you know, the way God God heals us is many, many times when we get to the point where we say, God, I don't want to be a victim anymore. I, um, I want to be the person that you created me to be. And I want to live that way. And there is no more exciting place than to be at that place. Every day is, every day is exciting. You know, every day is, what are you going to do today, God? What are you going to do today? Right. And so that's my story. And I, I love you people. I listen to Randy K too. And I just want to say um, how much I have received and spiritually, I look at life now. And I think maybe many of you that look at Randy K's ministries, look at life this way. I see it as this long tape measure. It goes on and on for eternity. <laughs> and there's a little dot right here. And that's where we're living right now. Why would we pour so much worry and time into this dot when this is what matters forever and ever and ever? Yeah. So this is where our, I believe, this is where our focus needs to be every day is that eternal, what's going to eternal, what's going to matter? Yes. When I leave, which I'm going to leave at some point, what's going to be, what's good, what have I done that's going to affect forever and ever? Mm -hmm. This is a very important period in our life, this short mist, as the Bible talks about, references it as in the context of eternity. And what's fascinating about your story, again, we're going to put uh, Secure at Last, Overcoming Life's Tragedies um, in the body of this message. I assume you can order it Amazon and Barnes & Noble, all of the major outlets. Um, but I think what's fascinating, so there are so many twists and turns, Sherry, to, to your life. And one would think going into it, I mean, you were the quote unquote good person, even as a child, kind, loving hearted, wanting to do the right thing, loving God, that, that you, uh, as, as I mentioned when we first started, that you deserve to have a good life. But when looking back, all of these instances that sullied that uh, served 
a grander purpose, even though God certainly did not want the bad to occur, others others inflicted that. Still, who you are today and how you minister to others is profoundly impactful as a result of the tenderness of your heart that has been tenderized by the sufferings that you've gone through. You are the person you are today because of all of that. Yes, absolutely, Randy. And I think that's another thing that if you are a person that feels like you're Job, <laughs> that you've had some pretty bad knocks in life, you know what? Those are the things that refine us. And I know you've heard this example, but I always think about the diamond, you know, and how that is a beautiful diamond, but it's encased with things that we need to have chiseled off till we can get to the diamond. And I believe those that have the most suffering get down to that shiny diamond because we have that chisel. We have that um, refining that brings that diamond out. And so if, if that's you, if you feel like, why me? Why, why did this happen to me? Know that God wants to use that, mm -hmm. that you have a diamond inside of you. You are precious. Mm -hmm. You have a story and you have your life. You were made just for who you are. Mm -hmm. Nobody else can be you. No one else can touch the people that you touch. No one else has the DNA that you have that can do the things that God has for you to do. Let him do it. Find joy. Find joy in your suffering. Yes. Boy, that, that is a oxymoron, isn't it? Find joy in your suffering. Because uh, that, that's something that only the Holy Spirit can do. Yes. To find that joy through all yes. of that uh, suffering. I'm going to ask you in a moment, Sherry, to pray for our audience. But I want to preface this. This is, as I've said multiple times, my probably my favorite time. But as you were speaking and as I've read your book and the like, I have been impressed that the Lord was speaking to me that people were going to be healed. And there are people watching this right now where you've thought, you know, I've been prayed over. I, you know, I've tried, I've been in therapy, I've been this, I've been done that, and nothing has worked. Well, for some of you, this is going to be your moment. Yeah. When you are healed. Mm. Just like when Sherry was healed of the aorta, the mm. uh, defect in her aorta, just as she was healed from a car crash that should have killed her, just as she was healed of uh, being raped and healed of that through forgiveness, just as the healing has taken place in her life, there's an impartation that's going to occur mm -hmm. in your life right now. So get prepared, mm -hmm. prepare your heart just to be still right now, mm -hmm. because God is going to work a miracle in your life. And so Sherry, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to pray for our audience, please. Father God, the love you have for each of my friends, every step of their life you've known, you have known, you've known the good, the bad, you know, when they've cried, those tears are precious to you, you know what they've hoped, you know what they've desired, what they've dreamed, you know how they've been abused, you know how they've been hurt, you know when it's been in jest and you've cried with them. They're not alone. Those times you never abandoned them. You are always with them. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would do your work. Your work is the work that lasts in our heart. It's not just words. It's supernatural. It's where you run in deep, that rotor rooter of the hurt that has caused us grief, that has caused us maybe unforgiveness, that has caused us to question maybe God. Holy Spirit, you're there. You understand. Yes. You do not condemn. Yeah. You understand questioning. You understand when we fail you, when we ignore you. 
you understand you were created in like we are through Jesus. You know every temptation. You know everything we've gone through. And yet you provide, you provide a plan that is perfect for each of my friends. A plan to redeem what the devil has stolen, the, the, that has taken and robbed them. Father, I pray right now that your spirit would bring the healing of forgiveness inside each and every spirit that's longing for healing. Father, I pray that you specifically would bring people or a person to them, yes. to walk with them, to hold them, to hear them, to not judge them, to have wisdom from above. And I pray, God, that they would choose even right now that they want healing. If yes. that's you, I just want you to pray these words with me. Dear Father, you know the longings of my heart. You know the desperation in my heart. You've heard every word. You've seen every tear. And God, I need you. I can't do this by myself. I can't sweep this under the carpet anymore. I need your help. Father, whatever your word is to me, keep my ears open. Spirit of God, speak to me. Speak to me how I can walk this walk of healing and be set free. And I pray that right now, Holy Spirit, as they have said that, you would reach into their hearts, that you would bring supernatural, divine healing, this, that your spirit right now is, we can't see it, but that doesn't mean it's not real. It is more real than us right now, just talking on this video. You are there with each of those people, and you hear them, and you know them, and you know what you've created them to be. So I just encourage you right now. To look up to God and to listen to his voice. He's going to speak to you. He's going to speak to you. I, I, I implore you to obey the little promptings he gives your heart. And I know that he will do that because he's for you. And he wants your healing even more than you do. He wants restoration. He longs. He longs for that relationship to be healed because he wants that he wants that fellowship, that friendship with you. Yes. He wants that more than even you do. Yes. Healing is there. It's there for you today. Walk in that healing. Yes. In Jesus' name. And I, I just want to just tell you another vision that I had to close because it just came to me really like I need to tell you this. Um, there was a point in my life uh, that I didn't think I could be healed. And um, I was in a service. There were people that were crying and repenting. And, and again, I felt like I was that different one that I just, I just keep slipping up. I keep on, you know, making mistakes. You know, I, why? And I was kind of beating myself up. And all of a sudden, again, I wasn't in the room. I couldn't hear anybody crying. I was in a garden. And it was crazy. It was beautiful. And I was a little child and I saw these big hands come from heaven and all I saw was hands, but I knew it was God's hands. And so I reached up and I took the hands and he started swinging me around like a, like a little girl, just like a daddy would swing around his little girl. And we started enjoying each other. He was laughing. I was laughing. We we're playing and that's not sacrilegious. He enjoys us. Yes. No, he wants to enjoy you. And, and it's us that put up the guard, the barriers. We're the ones that, oh, I'm not good enough. Yes. No, that's Satan's tool. That just, yes. all that does is just confuse you. You are worthy. You are worthy of his love. Yes. His love is for you. He wants to have fellowship. He wants to play with you. He wants to enjoy you. Let him do that. That's what healing and he said that to me, actually, 
when I got back into the room in my mind, I could see the room. He said, this is why I forgive you because I want this. And as soon as you ask me, this is what I do. I heal you and I forgive you because I want this. Yes. He wants to forgive us more than we want to forgive ourselves. Yes. Oftentimes. And Sherry, this has been absolutely wonderful. Now, our audience uh, may or may not know that they can contact us at randyk.org. But uh, you list in your book at the last page there are contacts yeah. for you. So you. if people want to reach you, how might you suggest uh, that? So there's an email in the back and it sits. It's secure at last. It will be in the back of the book. Secure at last. Uh, I'm trying to see if it was book. You have uh, to buy the book. Here we go. Get secure, it. There we go. Okay. Secure at last. Okay. At gmail.com. Okay. And if you want to buy the book, yeah, it is on Amazon. And there's so many more. There's a, of course, there's a lot more detail in there. Um, yes. And uh, it's just a real raw story. It's my story. It's God's encounter with us. And I pray that if you do get it, that you write a review. Because I am trying to get my book up in the search engine. It was just published. And um, so I want to get that out there to as many hurting people as I can. Yeah, the um, for those who don't know, um, the ranking system within Amazon in particular is predicated on the number of likes and the ratings. So um, I love this book. I don't say that uh, flippantly because I read a lot of books, um, but I'm just immersed in your story. I'm going to go back and actually reread uh, your book there. Uh, so I felt compelled before we close, Sherry, and this is something that I don't know why the Lord just impressed me with my heart, um, to offer an apology, um, for those of you who are maybe watching or listening to this, who've been accused by my brothers or sisters in Christ, who have been judgmental against you, who have been accusatory toward you you feel that maybe we're the enemy and I want to ask your apology as a proxy for my brothers and sisters in Christ for you having felt that way because the God of Jesus Christ doesn't feel that way towards you and uh, he just wants you to confess him as your Lord and Savior to invite him to take over your life for what he did on the cross so just be free that was how I felt mm -hmm. and I don't know I'm just throwing that out there I just mm -hmm. felt compelled to uh, to ask your forgiveness for um, for those mm -hmm. those who have accused you unrighteously mm -hmm. so um, that's different, isn't it, Sherry? Mm -hmm. so. I've not heard that before. <laughs> okay. Well, got to be obedient to the Lord, right? When that's yeah. leading, right. <laughs> even if it's off topic. Absolutely. So. <laughs> you okay. miss out on a lot of joyous occasions if you if you don't <laughs> if you don't speak them out. You know that uh, extreme extremely well. Okay. Well, Sherry, I we've been so blessed. I've been blessed by your sharing thank you for joining us and uh and we have some great parting words if you are indeed in christ jesus be of good cheer because heaven is in your future take care and god bless thanks for listening please like and subscribe and if you'd like further information go to our website at randyk.org where our mission is simple to share the great news of God's love.